Okay, uh, thank you, Randy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so thanks. Uh, I'm really excited to be able to talk to everyone this morning. Um, what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about what's ahead for probabilistic messaging for the winter of 2021, 2022, kind of applying a lot of the lessons that we learned last year during the test bed um, that we had, as, as Randy mentioned. Uh, next slide. So what we're going to talk about first is why, why do we even want to use probabilities in our messaging? Um, wh why is this a uh, something we want to move forward with. I think uh, Andy start, kind of started that off really nicely with the precip type in the previous talk. Um, and then we're going to move ahead to talk about last year's test bed and some of the lessons that we learned and what we found out from talking to forecasters um, during that test bed. Then we'll move to uh, John talking about our messaging strategy for winter events and, and how, you can, how you can message these type of events and why. And, and the process that it's all the process of the whole forecast process, not just uh, waiting till the end and pushing a button. And then Kelly's gonna talk about collaborating that message if you want, and, and why communicating probabilistic information also helps our partners. So it doesn't just help us because we have the statistical background, it has helps our partners and there's been a lot of research to look at that. And then we have a way for you all to provide us feedback so that we continue to learn, to adapt and to move forward. So next slide. So uh, just looking uh, ahead, um, compared to last year, there are a few changes coming. The, the biggest change, the biggest look change at least, is Graph Graphy DSS will now be the, the uh, graphic software that we'll be using in all probabilistic messaging. So that includes the PWPF or PropSnow um, web page that every office has but also all of the tools that, that Jerry provided to the test bed have all been converted to use Graphy DSS instead. And so it gives a nice more, a nicer, more professional look to all of our images. Um, and you can run those using the same tools we did before. And there'll be training coming out the, on that very shortly. Um, we've also added some new tools. One that I'm very excited about that I think you can use in your messaging to, to the public and partners is we'll now have an objectively produced uncertainty graphic. And that graphic is based on the, the, uh, distrib the difference between the 10th and 90th range. So it doesn't show the 10th and 90th range. It just looks at that, that number, compares it to a historical distribution, and determines if that is in the highest 25% or more uncertain than average, or in the lowest 25%, so less, less uncertain or more certain than average. And so that's something you could actually use for your partners to discuss uncertainty with a particular event. Um, we also have available for you is you can look at your forecast snowfall and see where it sits within the, the CDF. What's the percentile of your snowfall forecast compared to the ensemble? And it can help inform you whether you want to change that forecast or not. Are you up near the 90th percentile or are you closer to the 10th percentile and in different parts of your CWA? And finally, everyone will now have access to the box and whisker plots and bar plots um, assuming that you opt into the entire survey. And this is something that was sent to your management team uh, about a week and a half ago by Bruce. Um, and so you're having discussions about how, what that all means and uh, for your office and for your operations. So if we can go to the next slide. <clears throat> so why do we wanna use probabilities? Well, I think we've all known that uncertainty is part of the forecast process. It's part of the science. It's something that we all know. If you take the example on the right, left or right from the observed snowfall from one event we had last year, um, there's all, almost always some type of gradient in snowfall. And these gradients can be very tight. So that's a small shift in the snowfall can lead to several inches difference in the observation for a particular location. Um, it can also be due to precipitation type changes. If you have rain or freezing rain that lasts longer than, and you have that later change over the snow, suddenly you get this, this gradient that develops where it rained for a longer time than a place nearby. And so given all of this uncertainty that we know exists, we need to communicate that to partners. But for decades, all that we had for us was basically forecasts of snowfall. And, and that really hamstrung us because it really made us talk about snowfall in a much more deterministic way than actually existed. In fact, there were times I know in our office that we would actually almost have to talk around our snowfall graphic because we knew this uncertainty exists, yet we were showing a snowfall amount of say five inches in Sioux City, Iowa. And so, it really limited our ability to communicate uncertainty to the public and to our partners. And I really wanna emphasize providing uncertainty can make our forecast more valuable. And it's not just me saying that, 
that is something that research has shown by by various researchers like Julie Demuth or Susan Joslin have shown that that partners and the public get more value from our forecasts when we can talk about uncertainty in a way that they understand. So if we go to the next slide, it really comes down to this though for, for you, what it really means for you is it gives you power. And what I mean by this, it gives you the power on how you want to decide to message your forecast. So as I mentioned in the past, all we had was that single forecast graphic. And so we had to kind of design and wrap our message around a graphic that may not convey the story that we want to tell to our partners and to the public. But now, as you go through the forecast, as you look at the model data, as you look at the ensembles, you can start developing that story, developing that message you want to tell the partners, and then you pick and choose the graphics that will fit that story. So it's part, messaging becomes part of this whole process, that, that this whole forecast process that begins at the beginning of your shift and doesn't end till the end of your shift, because you need to examine the data to determine it, and then you can pick the graphic that you want to fit your story. You don't have to try and fit your story to a graphic. And that's really important. It makes it a lot easier to tell a story. If you can, tell, can look at a graphic, pick that graphic and say, yes, this graphic conveys the message I wanna to send to the partners and to the public. So if you go to the next slide, it also is about consistency. And this isn't about consistency externally, although that's also important. And Kelly will talk more about that. This is about internal consistency. In the past, without a messaging strategy that we're gonna talk about in a little bit, Forecasters could go from one type of message to another type of message, and it could co actually cause confusion because maybe one forecaster wants to talk about snowfall amounts, and the next forecaster doesn't feel so good about talking about snowfall amounts, so they pull back on it. Well, the, for the public now has this expect expectation that we're going to send out snowfall amounts, and suddenly they disappear. So this can cause confusion in the messaging. By following a strategy, you ensure that from shift to shift, you're following, progressing through a strategy that leads to from a very probabilistic forecast discussion or message to a much more deterministic forecast message from as you go through and the storm approaches from day seven to when the first flake of snow falls at day one. So if we go to the next slide, we can talk, we look at the 2020, 2021 test bed. And one thing that came out is the messaging strategy was very useful to the forecasters and they were comfortable applying it. Um, sure, at the beginning, it's a new thing and they have to get used to it, but very quickly forecasters adapted to it and it made sense to them and they were able to apply it in their day-to-day -day messaging for different weather events, not just snowfall, but also mixed precip, Arctic air, et cetera. And so it's something they found very useful and, and something we're very comfortable encouraging all of you to adopt as we move ahead into, the, into this winter. If we look at the next slide, um, we can also find that forecasters utilize probability of exceedance a lot for most snowfall event. And we also found out that this probability of exceedance graphics became more popular as the winter went on. And what we mean by that is forecasters began to see the utility and got comfortable with, with probability of exceedance. So there's an example from lacrosse here. They use probability of exceedance instead of a snowfall map to talk about the potential snowfall that could affect their CWA. So they aren't just stuck talking about two inches or four inches or six. They can talk about all three of them and discuss not just the mounts, but uncertainty with it and how there is that low potential for six or more inches of snow in the southern part of their CWA. So it gave them a lot more ways to discuss snowfall in a way they were comfortable with that was understandable and also provided reasons for the public and the partners to come back later to find more specific information on the upcoming storm. So if you go to the next slide, we also experimented with using different snowfall ranges. We had the default range, I'll call it the color bar range. It's basically the range based on the color bar at the bottom of every graphic. So zero to one, one to two, two to three, et cetera. And then we tested out using the range based on the probabilities uh, or the ensemble. So we used the 25th to 75th percentile was the most common. You could also use the 10th to 90th percentile. And one thing we found out in interviews or talking to forecasters and getting their feedback is there's a lot of strong opinions out there amongst forecasters on whether this, using these percentile ranges, especially when they get very large, like you see in Lamar's Iowa there with trace the five inches, whether those have utility or not. Some forecasters felt that it provided them a lot of information on uncertainty, 
and they use that inform that uncertainty information or those larger ranges to communicate uncertainty to the forecast to provide that context to the partners so they could understand why we had traced the five inches in Lamar's or why we had three to eight inches in Sioux City, which is larger than what we normally did. Other forecasters felt that these unusually large ranges undermined confidence in our forecast to the public and partners and felt that it was doing a disservice or decreased trust in the forecast. So what we wanna do this winter, and Kelly will talk about this more in a little bit, is we're gonna actually ask a question specifically on forecast ranges to our partners and to the public on how they under, well, just to our partners, I'm sorry, not to the public, on how they understand these ranges and, and how they utilize them, and not just these, but other um, information in the forecast. So um, we do, local office can decide to use the probabilistic ranges yet, but just understand there's more research being done by our team to understand how they go on. And to talk more about the ranges, I'm gonna turn it over to John Gagan here. He's a Sioux in Milwaukee, and he can talk some more about the ranges and their implications. So take it over, John. All right, Phil, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. All right, perfect. I'll spare you all from looking at my webcam. A little haggard after working a couple night shifts here, got off this morning and glad to join you. And uh, what we will talk about, I want to dive a little bit deeper into, into some of the, the things that Phil talked about. I'm going to do this by an example. And, and, and make no mistake, there were some, there is some consternation. Uh, with ranges and large ranges and, and discussing of uncertainty. And what I wanted to show, and this is a real world example. Uh, this, is, this is straight from a, a forecast from a couple of years ago, an early season snow event across the upper Midwest. And we're gonna look at a point. So this is gonna be data from a point within the snow band. So it's, in, it's within the heavy snow band and not on the edges. So this is right in the middle of uh, of a good uh, potential snowfall event forecast. And the blue line is the uh, probability of winter precipitation forecast or PWPF cumulative distribution function. And the inverse of this is what you would likely, you which is, is what you would see with the PWPF information that we've been providing for the past three to five years um, uh, internally and on our websites. Um, and I've highlighted in, in the green vertical dash bar the 50th percentile. And when we lay on the official point forecast for this point, it came in at 8.1 inches, which on the NWS color bar triggers the 8 to 12 inch uh, range uh, from that map. So if you see on the right, the color bar range, there's 8 to 12, and, and that's what the, the range is communicating. Now, again, I, I suspect most folks haven't viewed PWPF or snow forecast quite in this fashion. So I want to break this down real quick and, and what it means. And, and what this means is that for this range, this 8 to 12 inch range, for this particular point in this particular set of PWPF information, there's a 35% chance of 8 to 12 inches of snow. But there's a 65% chance of snow outside of 8 to 12 inches. And in fact, as you can see graphically here, and again, we don't usually visualize it this way, so this is a little different. You can see that we are messaging at this particular point, the highest end of the probability spectrum to the point where there's really only about a 10% chance of getting greater than, any, uh, greater than 10 inches and about less than 0.1% of a chance of actually getting to the high end of this range that we are communicating. So, if the, you know, this, this should give you pause for concern. So again, this is, this is looking at the underlying PWPF data as part of your forecast process. And if the eight to 12 inch range gives you pause for concern, and it should, well, what's your next option? Well, you could provide a single point forecast, a deterministic forecast on your snowfall uh, map, but is that any better? Well, again, given the probabilistic information shown, now you're only focusing on an extremely narrow portion of the distribution. So what are your options now? Well, you could look at the probabilistic ranges. Uh, and you can see here, we've got the 25th, the 75th, the 10th, the 90th percentiles here uh, showing their ranges. And, and, and fortunately, and this is kind of a, a foreshadowing to a presentation Phil and I are gonna do in about a month and a half, on December 15th to dive into the PWPF and how to use this in your in your forecast process better. PWPF is, is pretty reasonably calibrated 
over uh, over a course of time. So you can see that this is what you can communicate by using the 10th to 90th or 25th to 75th. But if the range size gives you pause for concern, this is where the probabilistic messaging effort comes in. It diversifies your options. You could leverage the percentile ranges or you could utilize one of the several different types of probabilistic graphics to help communicate your message. As Phil uh, talked about just a little bit ago, the exceedance maps uh, were very popular as the test bed went on. Folks got more and more comfortable using that in operations and in helping to communicate. Uh, so again, if this entices you to learn a little bit more, again, this is kind of pulling the curtain back on PWPF and what we're really saying when we produce snowfall maps. And if you think this is an uncommon example, I have many, many, many examples of this particular issue where we're only, we're only explaining a small portion or the high end portion of our distribution, probabilistically speaking. There's a lot of examples out there. This is very, very common. So you know, join us on December 15th and we can, we can talk more about this. You can learn more about this and we'll do a deeper dive into the verification PWPF output. And, and how to use it. And just because I know people are, what, what was the observed snow? Well, the observed snow ended up being a bit between five and six inches. So you can see the eight to 12 shot a little high. So on, on to, you know, we can, make, uh, we can make a lot of graphics. PWPF unlocks a lot of information, but it's important to establish that it's just no easy button to messaging. We can make a ton of graphics. But remember that any particular graphic or set of graphics cannot serve as a surrogate to what you, the meteorologist, does best, which is to contextualize that information, to adequately communicate those impacts. You know, imagery is important, don't get me wrong, but it's merely an assistant in this process. It's not a driving force. It's one of my favorite slides here. You know, there, there just is no magic button, as Stimson J. Cat here loves to push. We simply cannot image our way out of this messaging challenge. It's the messaging isn't merely a byproduct of images that GFE just vomits out that we can do at the end of a shift or during, you know, during the end of our shift and, and then send out, you know, via t tweets or social media or, or DSS packets or what have you. It, re it requires an expert to contextualize complex data to communicate that confidence, those impacts, those potential scenarios. In other words, none of this works without you. And only you can bridge the gap between the data, understanding the data, understanding what that data is saying, and then delivering the most useful forecast for our partners. And, and not all images will be useful or effective from event to event. It's really gonna depend on the event type, your predictability, the quality of the guidance we utilize. And, and, and again, be aware of and fight the temptation to fit a message to a particular type of image. There are going to be times where multiple types of images will be of great help. That's wonderful. But there's also going to be times where you may have at best only a few or maybe even one choice. And there will be some rare occasions where predictability is just that bad, where you're on your own to synthesize a visual to discuss your unique situation. So, you know, you decide on that message throughout the forecast process and then select those graphics to fit that message and hopefully predictability is on your side. So we have, uh, you know, as a result of this effort, we, we have a lot more to do with this, this, this probabilistic messaging effort. You know, while at face value shows a lot of what to do with images and how do we create these images and things like that, but it's, it's really what happens outside of GFE. It's really about the meteorologist's approach to messaging. It's a joint venture between the database forecaster and the IDSS forecaster, ensuring that attention to messaging detail is part of every aspect of the forecast process, soup to nuts, beginning to end, and not just a byproduct at the end. It's a conscious, active, end-to-end -end engagement that's critically, cr critically important. And, and for those that take part, choose to take part in the prob messaging effort this winter, you're gonna receive uh, training, uh, uh, modules, documentation, uh, and, and specifically talking about a messaging funnel. And within this particular document is a link to a modernized forecast process uh, effort, which credit goes to Chauncey Schultz and out of Bismarck and, and Tommy Grafnauer out of Grand Forks, who, who kind of spearheaded this uh, starting a few years back and developing uh, this type of approach and, and the messaging funnel. Uh, and these are this is important to read as part of your preparation and to have handy as a resource. So 
what does this kind of look like, developing the message throughout the forecast process? I suspect for most people, it's going to be pretty familiar. Uh, and what's critical to this process is that partnership between the database forecaster and the IDSS forecaster. While each serve a unique role in the process, their efforts are intrinsically related. And it all starts with knowing where you're at. What's the ongoing message? What is it? Uh, the conversations about uh, this, you know, they start at the beginning of the shift and they continue throughout the day. And next, you get the new data to come in, assess your predictability. What's the situation? What's changed? Has predictability become worse or improved? Seek and apply conceptual models. Run that conceptual model for your situation through the deterministic and ensemble output. Interrogate that, improb that probabilistic information. Run that PWPF multiple times throughout your shift. And both the database forecaster and the IDSS forecaster play critical roles here. And it's not a duplication of effort, mind you. It's what each forecaster's focus brings to the conversation. While the database forecaster uh, is, is likely seeking an opportunity to address the deterministic database, the IDSS forecaster is reviewing that same information to shape the necessary approach to messaging. And using the probabilistic information informs predictability and then ultimately confidence. It allows you to get a full view of the range of possibilities, failure points, and worst case scenarios. And you should be able to physically explain what you see in the probabilistic information and why. And that's, that's a key component to this. You know, we're not just throwing numbers around there. We have to physically understand what's going on. And again, I'm going to have to emphasize and caution that this is just, you know, this is one of those caveats. You may not get a full view of all possibilities. You know, remember, our ensemble, ensemble systems do tend to be under dispersive. So once there's a handle on that predictability, this leads to strategy. You know, is there a direct relationship between the degree of potential impacts from an event and the lead time when messaging should begin? The answer and approach differs based on event type. So say a synoptic large scale low system versus a mesoscale banding or link effect situation and their inherent predictability. You know, this is once again, a critical time for the database forecaster and IDSS forecaster to be working closely together. And once there's agreed upon approach internally, collaborate an ideal messaging approach with surrounding offices, you know, using the science-based and statistics-based reasoning as that foundation for discussions. And this may include discussions with national centers and, and others, and, and again, draw upon that wisdom of the crowd. And the bottom line here is that message development occurs throughout the entire process. And keep these following questions in mind. What do we know? What don't we know? What does the data tell us about predictability? Who's at risk? What should they do? When should they do it? What if the forecast changes? How should we be prepared to pivot? What are the alternative scenarios one should prepare for? Perhaps you need to message why a scenario may or may not occur. Leverage those ensembles and probabilistic information. That's what this is all about. And again, we as meteorologists are here to provide that context. We are the critical linchpin piece to this. Apply what we do best. Put that climatology conscience into, into play here. What's, what's typical for your area? Is this unusual? What's the conceptual model of the event? What's your experience? What do you bring to this? And, and this will ensure we develop the most useful forecast uh, for our partners. So to wrap it up before I hand it off to Kelly here, you know, to help you with this process, the Prob Messaging Master uh, document and training materials will get you started. We'll get these to everybody here within the next couple of weeks. And within those documents are guidance for the four different phases and, and have this funnel up here for you the, from the start IDSS outlook all the way down to the watch warning phase. And, and it's impossible to provide each and every possible scenario within the guidance, but we try to do as best we can to give you kind of a good look at this uh, from a, from a uh, you know, broader view to, to, to help you attack the forecast process each day in this kind of mentality. And you know, as you step through the process, think about how this funnel plays out into a modernized forecast process, where the database forecaster and IDSS forecaster work lock and step throughout to develop your message. So Kelly, let's go ahead and hand it off to you as we start to talk about collaboration. All right, thanks, John. So once you identified your messaging strategy, as John described, using the, the funnel, um, it's important that we collaborate this with our neighbors. Just like the gridded forecast, if we are saying something completely opposite from our neighbors in the grids, it gets noticed and we lose trust of our partners. 
And the message needs to be the same. If we're, if we're sending out conflicting messages from office to office, we're gonna lose the trust of our partners. And so it is important to collaborate this um, on a daily basis. On the next slide, you'll see an example of um, the, what we use, the tool we use to do collaboration during the original testbed. Uh, all it was was a simple Google Sheet. And all we asked is that each office went in and provided a brief little synopsis of what their, where their confidence lies and what their messaging strategy is. So the idea was offices discuss um, internally what they want people to know on that particular day, what the message is gonna be. They share those thoughts by 8Z and 1830Z on the mid shift and day shift respectively and put it in the dashboard. And that's probably a little earlier than what most people are used to in terms of messaging. So I know a lot of times it gets pushed to the very last um, hours of the day. So this is forcing you to think about it a little bit earlier. And then if you notice something, once everybody's entered their information, if you notice something that you wanna chat with your neighbors about, um, the test bed pretty much resoundingly found AWIPS collaboration was the best way to do that with your neighbors. So again, this it's meant to be simple um, and it's not meant to take a lot of time to submit your information, but we want you thinking about it and collaborating it with your neighbors. So in the next slide, um, I imagine people out there are thinking, this is all great probabilistic information, it's awesome, but do partners in the public really understand this data? And if you're thinking that, it's a great question. I've, I've had the same thoughts myself. Uh, what we do know is that there is a lot of published research papers out there. Um, and in fact, Dr. Uh, Joseph Ripberger has created a systematic review um, looking at these publications and asking that exact question is, how do people interpret this data and do they understand it? And so I have a quote on this slide and you can go out and look at this webpage. There's a link to it on um, the Prob Messaging Google Sites page, or we can make sure it's provided. The, we're also going to do, our team's gonna do a follow-up webinar that includes information just on this. But uh, what they have found in this repository is that overwhelmingly probabilistic information increases the trust and understanding of the forecast. So it is helping our partners and the public. Now, if this still makes you feel a little uncomfortable, um, on the next slide, they go on to say that our partners in the public are not statisticians. Do you have the next slide, John? In fact, they, they need us to take the probabilistic information and make it as straightforward and easy to understand as possible in order to avoid the information overload. And this isn't an easy task. As John pointed out before, that it, it's not an easy button. It's not one graphic that we can throw out and, and say, here, this will solve all your problems. And so we want as much feedback as possible, and we'd love for, for more offices to join us in this effort so we can learn what works and what doesn't work. On the next slide, you'll see um, that our team is also committed to this. We have a survey that we are going to send out to partners we're taking it through the formal survey process, so it has to be reviewed by folks up at NOAA and OMB. Um, in fact, it was published in the Federal Registrar um, just this week, and so it's undergoing that 60-day review. And we hope to have it ready um, by early 2022. The, the survey is a collaboration with the Northern Plains WCMs, as well as Julie DeMuth from NCAR, and we are, we are asking questions directly relating to how people use the information, how they interpret it, and especially graphics such as really large snowfall ranges. What is the threshold for the partner of us being correct versus um, you know, having, having a higher snowfall or smaller snowfall range? How do they use that data? How do, we, how do we present this in a way that's useful and can be understood? So that is in the works. Um, the next slide wraps up this presentation. We have a Google Sites page that you can go and visit and take a look and, and read, um, find all the information 
out on that page. And you can also reach out to us directly if you have any questions or comments or concerns. That's cr.probmessaging at noaa.gov. And you can see the loose list of, of team members. If there's someone you just want to individually reach out to, we are more than happy um, to answer any questions or uh, have you join this the test bed for the year next year going forward. Um, with that, uh, we'd be happy to answer any questions, but I will hand it back um, to Allie.